As you can probably tell, the box is there, a uh, misplaced filing cabinet there. Eh, there's just stuff everywhere that's going to be organized later on, but all in due time. I'm just so glad to be here. There's so much room, and I can back the camera up more. But unfortunately for that, now I have to wear pants when I do my reviews. <sighs> well, so long for being free and breezy. But anyway, today's game is going to be one of those, you know, I think Capcom has a fear of money and success, otherwise, why else would they make this game free? I'm not surprised that Capcom sunk money into this fan game, actually. After all, it features Street Fighter, and if there's one thing Capcom is really good at, it's milking Street Fighter for all it's worth. I've gotten to the point where I think that Street Fighter is all that they make now. After all, look what they've turned Resident Evil to, which is another series they continue to milk even though the cow is dried up. Look at the original games. It used to be an adventure game where you collect items and rub them on walls to unlock doors with horror elements thrown in. Now it's just some action game with mutated monsters and an attempt to recapture that zombie-esque feeling the series used to have. When it comes to Street Fighter, Capcom takes a Nintendo approach when it comes to Mario and Zelda. Beat the blob of red mush that used to be a dead horse in the hopes that it coughs up another game, while ignoring the cooped up horses ready to gallop. It's no secret that Capcom ignores series like Darkstalkers, Rival Schools, and Ghosts and Goblins. Or they completely butcher series like Resident Evil, Bionic Commando, or Lost Planet. Or they trick themselves into thinking that nobody likes Mega Man anymore. Like Capcom Europe blaming fans when Mega Man Legends 3 was cancelled, citing lack of fan support, which was not true. Mighty No. 9's Kickstarter got four million dollars. Really? Lack of fan support? Capcom, I have a honest question for you. Is your head so far up your ass that your body's a hat? But here's what happens when you make a fan game so good that the owners of the game series give you funding to complete it. Street Fighter Cross Mega Man was developed by this guy whose name I will never be able to pronounce. Showed off his prototype Mega Man vs. Street Fighter to Capcom USA, who gladly threw money at him to finish it, and it's hosted on the Capcom Unity page. Capcom took the responsibility of funding, marketing, and quality assurance. Capcom has also stated that they wanted to do a port to home consoles. Originally, they wanted to, but the developer did not have a license to do so. And they wanted to get it out for Mega Man's 25th anniversary, which is also the same year as Street Fighter's 25th anniversary as well. Originally, there were crashing problems, no save system, but it was fixed with an updated version going by the same name, just with version 2.0 tagged onto the end of it. Christian Sevensons, Capcom's Senior Vice President of Planning and Business, said that the amount of times the game has been downloaded exceeded his expectations. So if the amount of downloads exceeded your expectations, why not start making more Mega Man games? No wonder Capcom's up for sale, they have no idea what they're doing! Like the NES Mega Man games, the art style and music is your classic 8-bit graphics and sound. The music is 8-bit renditions of Street Fighter character themes mixed with Robot Master stage themes. They did a really good job at capturing the authentic Mega Man look much like how 9 intended. Instead of stages based on Robot Masters, the stages are based on the theme of the Street Fighter character you'll be facing. I'm glad to see a variety of enemies now. Unlike Mega Man Project Zero, which used the same enemies over and over, which consisted of those flying shields and helmet things, there's all sorts of enemies. Some even using the weapons or weapons similar to those that coincide with the weapon you'll be getting from the boss. I actually had a joygasm when I saw the Rush Jet at the beginning of one of the stages as it reminded me of Teguman's stage from Mega Man 8, which I thought was the most fun stage in the game because of the shooting areas. Everything in this game is fresh and original, which is perfect for both Mega Man and Street Fighter's anniversary, so it does both series justice pretty well. The gameplay is like your usual Mega Man game. You can jump, slide, shoot, and charge, but unlike Project Zero, which it was too fast, this is slower and on par with how a Mega Man game should feel and control. The guy, whose name I still can't pronounce, did a really good job at keeping the authentic feeling of Mega Man, and I'm glad that after you take a hit of damage while charging your Mega Buster that you don't need to go through recharging it. That's the one thing that always annoyed me about some of the classic Mega Man games. The stages and enemies can be a decent challenge. They're not too hard, but they're not too easy. Although there are times where you can get swarmed with things and you need to have those jumping and sliding skills perfected if you want to avoid getting hit. The hardest stage I would say, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this character's right, I don't play Street Fighter, so I don't know. You're in stage because of the falling platforms and spikes. But the hardest part of the game is the boss fights themselves. Unlike your usual Robot Master fights, there's no real predictable pattern, or at least there wasn't one that I could tell, as it seemed more random than anything. And there's no reaction when you use their weakness against them. They don't get stunned or repeat their pattern, if they have any. If 
feels like you're fighting characters from a fighting game. So it goes from a run and gun to a fighting game, just without fighting game controls. The Street Fighter characters move pretty fast, and as you hit them, they build up a super meter, which they'll use once in a while. I want to say that I found that some of them need a bum rush tactic where you run in and spam their weakness, and others need a hit and run tactic. For example, Chun-Li I had to avoid while C Viper I had to bum rush. And with some of them, you don't have a choice. Like Rose, who is just relentless and is on top of you pretty much the entire time. And using her weakness is more setting up landmines because the game doesn't tell you to hit down and shoot to kick the melon ball. The story is cheesy, but it's really good cheese. Mega Man is getting ready to relax on his 25th anniversary, but the Street Fighter characters want one more battle before they celebrate their 25th anniversary as well. It's silly, but that's not bad and makes for an entertaining premise. Overall though, I had a really fun time with that and it provided a very unique experience for a Mega Man game with a good chance. Challenge. Although I did find the game to be a little stingy when it came to E-Tanks. Once you grab an E-Tank and use it, that's it. It's gone. Even if you get a game over in the same stage that you picked it up in. I think it would have been nice to have Auto Shop Return allowing you to buy lives in E-Tanks. While some may argue that it would make the game easier, I argue that it's optional and you don't need to use it. Of course, this game gets a perfect score, but let's wind things down and recap this month's theme. The entire point of this month was to bring fan games into the light. I did an indie game month a year ago, and we'll probably do another at some point. But the difference between indie games and fan games is that indie games can get money from it without worrying about copyright infringement, and they are making a game based on their own artistic vision. A fan game is different. The people who make them will 99.99% .99 of the time never see a dime for their efforts. There are rare occasions like Street Fighter Cross Mega Man, where the holder of the franchise may pay the person to finish the game if it's good enough. But like the two Sonic fan games I reviewed, they will always be just that, fan games that will never get noticed. I'm not saying that fans who do things like fan art or fan games or mods to existing games will never go anywhere. I heard that the hats in Team Fortress 2 were started by a fan and look where it's gone now. Fighting is Magic got support from Lauren Faust. Chris Whitehead did remakes of Sonic 1 and 2 for mobile platforms. So if you're a fan of something and think you can go somewhere in the gaming industry from your fan work, the truth is you can, but don't count on it. Your chances are on par with winning the lottery, so I wish you the best of luck. But that's it for Fan Game Month, and if you make fan games and hope to make it big someday, I wish you the best of luck.